Good morning, church. Christ is risen. Happy, you're well trained. Happy Easter to all of you. It's so good to see you all today. If you're new with us, welcome, especially whether you're online or if you're worshiping in this full sanctuary. My name is Jeremy Troxler, and I serve as lead pastor here at Guilford College United Methodist Church. And today is a beautiful and joyful day. Today is Resurrection Sunday, Easter Day. Today is the day that we celebrate that Christ, who died on the cross, has been raised. And the hope that we have in him, because he is alive, enables us to be raised out of all the things that keep us from God and keep us from each other and that keep us from the life that God intends for us. And so today is a day of the deepest joy when we celebrate God's decisive victory over evil and sin and death, sorrow and sadness and grief. They have their say. But the resurrection is God's last word, and it will be the final word to us, and it is a word of life. And so today is a day when we celebrate. It is um, the biggest service of the year for us. In a real way, we are an Easter people. The reason Christians meet for worship on Sunday morning is because early that Sunday morning, they went to Jesus' tomb and found the tomb was empty. So every Sunday is a little Easter And every Easter is the biggest Sunday of all. And we're just really grateful that all of you here could be here and share in this day. Our hope is that all of us would experience something of that joy, that promise, that hope of life that today brings to us. A little later in the service, we're going to ask you during the offering to sign a a blue attendance pad that we have at the end of the pew. We do hope you might do that. We'd love to know who all's here um, and especially to welcome any of you who are new. Um, but, But we pray that this time will be a blessing for all of us. So as we get started with the service, we're going to start with a kind of call and response, a kind of call to worship. And what I'd like to ask you to do is to please stand as you're able and um I'm going to call out the the first words that are in the kind of italics printed. And if you would all join in the words in bold. And we're going to do this three times. Are you ready? And we want to let everybody hear us. All right. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's remain standing for our opening hymn.
Please remain standing for our uniting together as Christians throughout the ages have done to say the Apostles' Creed, which will be on the screen. Let us say this together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Let us, let us pray together. Resurrected Lord, Jesus the Christ, our Messiah and Lord, today we come with grateful hearts, with much joy, Coming to you in worship, we bow down before you, knowing that you are the giver of life. You have become life to us. Open the door so that we can abundantly live, loving you and serving our neighbor. Today, God, we ask that your Holy Spirit will be present here, that as we worship all of our thoughts, all of our prayers, the beautiful music, and all that is done will be like a fragrance to you of praise and worship. For you, O oh God, alone are worthy of our praise. And today we each one are grateful because today we celebrate together your resurrection. Now lead and guide in this service, we pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. As Donna comes, and children, please come to meet with Donna. I also just want to take a moment to thank the North Carolina Brass Band, who's here with us and sharing uh, worship uh, through music. Thank you. Come on, friends. Good morning. Come on, friends. We've got lots of friends for you to see today. Hi. Maybe she'll sit and not join us here. Good girl. Good job. Hi. Good morning. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Christ is risen. risen Y'all want to help me with that again? Christ is risen. Christ is risen Good job. Good job. So we have butterflies here today, and of course Jordan is here on the most special day of the year to celebrate with all of us together. But we have butterflies, because butterflies are such a beautiful symbol of new life. Y'all help me with the life cycle of the butterfly. They start out as what? A caterpillar. A caterpillar and they crawl along the ground and they eat leaves and they're pretty limited to where they can go, aren't they? They just crawl on the ground. And then what happens? They turn into a chrysalis or a cocoon. They spin this web that they go inside and it looks like their life is over, doesn't it? Because nothing is happening in that cocoon. Much like when Jesus died on the cross, he was taken down off the cross, he was placed into a tomb, the stone was rolled across the entrance to the tomb, and it looked like Jesus' life was over, didn't it? But what happens inside that cocoon or that chrysalis with the butterfly? Is something changing? Yes. He's yeah. changing, isn't he? Yes. He or yeah. she. They're, cha they're what? They're growing, they're changing, they're becoming a new creation. And so then you start to see that cocoon or chrysalis, it'll wiggle a little bit, and then out comes this beautiful butterfly, and they stretch their wings, and they dry their wings, and they take off, and they are able to soar and live freely. Yes. Jesus 
when the women went to the tomb after the stone was rolled away, they went to honor Jesus, thinking that his life was over. But what did they find? The tomb was empty. The stone had been rolled away. The tomb was empty. And an angel says, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Jesus has risen. And that's why we celebrate today. And frankly, every Sunday we come to church, we celebrate that Jesus is alive and that we can know him and live with him forever. But today is the special day that we celebrate that morning when the tomb was empty and Jesus is alive. So Christ is Yay! risen. So you guys, what we're going to do is we're going to all go to children's worship. Then we're going to come back downstairs. We're going to ask your parents to um, get you from the parlor, which is the room just outside the sanctuary. Then we're all going to go out to the front lawn. We can get group, group picture or individual pictures. And then guess what we're going to do with the butterflies? Let them go. We're going to let them go and let them be free, just as we are free in Christ. That's right. All right, you guys ready to pray before we go? Aren't they beautiful? They are so beautiful. They're called painted lady butterflies. Aren't they beautiful? Don't no. They do have a short life. They do. You're right, they do. Okay, guys, are you ready to pray before we go? All righty. Dear God, we are so grateful for your love for us. We thank you that your son Jesus is alive today. Christ the Lord is risen indeed. And Father, how grateful we are that when we know you and when we love you, that we can live as free as these butterflies to live the best, most abundant, joyful life that you have given us. We love you and praise you in the precious name of Jesus. And all of God's children together say, Amen. 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 All right, guys, I'll see you outside. Emily, would you like to carry those outside? Thank you. Well, just as Miss Donna pointed out, he lives, so stand and let's sing about it.
I, this morning, I get to share with you some wonderful news about our Easter offering and our regular offerings as well. Part of our worship uh, is always to give something in an offering to the Lord's work, both here in this place and outside of the walls of this church. Uh, for Easter and all through Lent, actually, We've been taking up a special offering. We call it the Easter Mission Offering. And the Easter Mission Offering has um, a purpose to help the Client Choice Pantry at Greensboro Urban Ministry. Uh, this is a, a ministry that provides food for many in our community. And uh, we, during March Madness, collected over 980 pounds of food. But this offering hopes to supply produce, fresh produce for the clients. So uh, if you would be interested today, and if you're a visitor, uh, we, of course, in no way would want you to feel obligated to give. But if you would like to give something today, uh, we'll be passing the plate in just a minute. And uh, we ask that you uh, write on the envelope, there are envelopes in front of your pews, uh, if you want to go to the Easter Mission Offering or on your check. Otherwise, there's also very easily to give texting or online. It will take you to the website. You just look, need to look for the drop-down box that says Easter Mission Offering. Um, also, everybody here, if you would look for the blue pad in the corner of your pew, uh, like it was mentioned earlier, if you'd sign it with your name and anything else you'd like us to know uh, and pass it down the pew, that way we'll know who was here. Let us pray. Lord, we worship you today. We thank you for your goodness, for your son Jesus Christ who made life available to us, hope, faith, and love. And Lord, with this offering, we ask that you would bless so that we can provide for others, others who are in need, others who are loved by you. We pray in the name of Christ, our resurrected Lord. Amen.
Happy Easter. My name is Mark Townsend. Please stand as you're able for the reading of Scripture. And when I'm finished reading, please remain standing for the reading of Scripture in Spanish. Our reading today is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 through 8, the New Revised Standard Version. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified, and he has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the word of God for the people of God. Marcos 16, versos del 1 al 8. Cuando pasó el sábado, María Magdalena, María la madre de Santiago y Salomé compraron especias aromáticas para ir a ungir el cuerpo de Jesús. Muy de mañana, el primer día de la semana, apenas salido el sol, se dirigieron al sepulcro. Iban diciéndose unas a otras, ¿Quién nos quitará la piedra de la entrada del sepulcro? Pues la piedra era muy grande. Pero al fijarse bien, se dieron cuenta de que estaba corrida. Al entrar en el sepulcro, vieron a un joven vestido con un manto blanco, sentado a la derecha, y se asustaron. No se asusten, dijo. Ustedes buscan a Jesús el Nazareno, el que fue crucificado, ha resucitado. No está aquí. Miren el lugar donde lo pusieron. Pero vayan a decirles a sus discípulos y a Pedro, Él va delante de ustedes a Galilea. Allí lo verán tal como les dijo. Temblorosas y desconcertadas, las mujeres salieron huyendo del sepulcro. No dijeron nada a nadie porque tenían miedo. Dios bendiga su palabra.
Amen. Thank you, choir. A little earlier, we said Christ is risen. Hallelujah. And a loose translation of hallelujah is woohoo. And that's what I was <laughs> led to offer in response to that. So thank you all. Um, he has been raised. He is not here. Would you be in prayer with me, please? Gracious God, by your Holy Spirit and by a power greater than us, we ask that you would speak and be present in our words and in our hearing in such a way that we hear again and experience your living hope. For we ask this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. One of the most popular and historic bars in the stunningly beautiful college town of Chapel Hill, North Carolina, I am told, is an establishment with a very unusual name. The name of this particular establishment is He's Not Here. Now, contrary to what a Duke and a State fan suggested this morning, the bar He's Not Here was not named after the response to a question about whether Hubert Davis is still in the NCAA tournament. Um, we, had a, we had a short life cycle, kind of like a butterfly. Um, but no, he's not here. It is named after what the bartender has been trained to say in case any parent or girlfriend calls to ask if their son or significant other is there. Sorry, he's not here. A few years ago, I traveled to a minister's conference. And when I got into town, I was supposed to find my pastor friend, David, who was going to be my roommate. And I got to the conference center, and I checked in, and I put on my name tag around my neck. And I asked the clerk behind the desk if David had already checked into the hotel, if he was here. And the clerk said, no, he's not here. You just missed him. He checked in, and I think he went up to the hotel room. So I rode the elevator up to our floor, and I put the card in the door, and I went in. But David wasn't there. So I bumped into a mutual friend in the hallway and I asked, have you seen David? Yeah, but he's not here. You just missed him. I think he was going down to the cafeteria to get something to eat. So I went down to the cafeteria and I scanned the crowd, but I didn't see David. And so I asked another mutual friend, has David been here? David, yeah, I think he was here. You just missed him. I think he went back to the convention center. And I spent a whole afternoon just chasing after David, looking for his every move. But every place I went, David was always one step ahead of me. Every place I went looking for him, I was told, he's not here. He's gone ahead of you. He's not here. He's gone ahead of you. That's the shocking news that the women are told when they arrive at Jesus' tomb on that Sunday morning. But really, those are the words that it feels like we've been told all throughout the gospel of Mark. He's not here. He's gone on right ahead of you. Over the past few months, we've been studying Mark's version of the good news about Jesus. And the biggest thing Jesus invites his his disciples to do throughout Mark is just to follow after him. Come with me. Follow me, he says to the fisherman, to the tax collector. To those among the crowds who yearn for a different kind of life. And as we're reading the gospel, the whole gospel gives this feeling that the Christian life is mainly about trying to just keep up with Jesus. We've said one of the most common words in Mark is the word immediately. Over and over Mark says, and immediately Jesus went into the wilderness. And immediately Jesus called them beside the lake. And then immediately Jesus entered the synagogue. And then immediately Jesus... The whole gospel is written in such a way that you get the impression that Jesus is speed walking, on the move, darting this way and that, disappearing around corners and behind trees. And his disciples are just breathlessly trying to follow behind, tracking his footsteps, panting to keep up, asking about which way that he went, not knowing one unexpected place he might have led them next. There's one time, for instance, Jesus gets up while it's still dark before the sun has risen in the morning and he goes out to a deserted place to pray by himself. And after the sun rises, his disciples go looking for him, but they can't find him. They hunt everywhere for him there in the early sunrise. No, have you seen Jesus? Nope, he's not here. I think he went that way. 
And finally, they find him and they say, Jesus, everybody's been looking for you. But what does Jesus do? Does he stay in place and wait for folks to catch up with him? No, what he tells them, I think it's time for us now to go share the good news in the next town. Let's go. Follow me. And so out of breath, we follow Jesus through Mark's gospel these many weeks, just trying to keep up. We went with him down to the Jordan River and we watched him being baptized. Even heard a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. With him I am well pleased. We've heard him preach and tell people that heaven was breaking into earth. That we could be part of the kingdom of God right now. So we need to change our lives and get with the program. We saw just the hem of his garment make a woman whole. And just the touch of his hand raise a little girl to life. We saw how Jesus turned what people thought was the end of their story into just the middle of the story, just the beginning of their story. We watched Jesus take on hypocritical leaders who had turned faith in God into something that crushed people instead of setting them free. And our mouths fell open when he told us that he was going to the city of Jerusalem to die on a cross. But he told us, if we really want to find out what life is all about, then we have to take up our own cross. That we have to die to all of those things that keep us and the world from God and from our truest self and from the life God intends. That we have to join with others and follow him. Love God, he told us. Love your neighbor. Love yourself. Follow me. And so we followed him into the city on a donkey. And we followed him into the temple as he turned over the tables. And we followed him up the steps to an upper room where he fed us a last meal. And we followed him into the garden where he went to pray. But then we could follow him no more. Jesus went to his cross completely alone. Look around at the place where Jesus dies. Where is Peter? He's not here. Where is James? He's not here. Where is John? He's not here either. None of them are here. And neither are we. But our sins are. Our failures are. Our fears are. Our guilt is. It's there. And so now we come to the ending of Mark's gospel. And we remember how after Jesus dies, a kind man named Joseph wraps his body in a linen cloth and places it inside a tomb. When someone you love dies, you know what the day after is like. You feel lost, like you're in a bad dream. One of the things that gets you through is having the arrangements to focus on. Writing the obituary, picking out the casket, ordering the flowers... The women who've been Jesus' friends decide to focus on the arrangements. They buy some spices so they can properly anoint Jesus' body for burial. Something there hadn't been time to do before the Sabbath day. And when the Sabbath day finally ends and the sun rises up on the next day and it's safe, the women head in the early morning light out to the cemetery. And along the way, they realize they have no idea how they're going to get inside the tomb with its great big stone there. I wonder if there are any of you who find yourself in a time in life where, to be honest, you're not exactly sure how you're going to keep going and how it's all going to work out. But you just keep going anyway, trusting that it will. Well, the women aren't really sure how they're going to get into the tomb, but they keep going anyway. And then they discover the shock of their lives. The stone has already been rolled back. All the heavy lifting has already been done. All the obstacles that would keep them from Jesus have been taken away. A door has been opened, not just in a cave, but someone has said, a door has been opened in the whole universe. What has once been closed is now suddenly open. And the women look at each other and they just don't understand what could have happened. It doesn't compute. 
I wonder if anything's ever happened to you that was so unexpected, so out of the ordinary, so shocking that it sent a shiver up your spine, gave goosebumps to your goosebumps, made you feel like you just stepped into some kind of movie. That's what the women feel when they enter the tomb. There was a writer named J.R.R. Tolkien who wrote the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and he coined a word that he called the you catastrophe. He took the word catastrophe and he put EU, which means good, in front of it. And he said, a catastrophe is some terrible event that makes everything fall apart and unravel. But he said he thinks there's some other events that happen that are so good, it's like the opposite of a catastrophe. It's a good catastrophe. Because when these things happen, it turns everything towards the good. He said it's like all of the sad things are becoming untrue. What the women discover is a you catastrophe. This amazing turn towards the good. Because they're greeted in the graveyard not by the dead, but by the living. There's a young man there. He's dressed in a white robe. No wings observed, but he's likely an angel messenger. The women are afraid. They shudder. The man in the white robe can see their fear, and he tells them, don't be afraid. And then comes the news that shifts the entire world on its axis. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised, spine tingles. He has been raised, goosebumps appear. He is not here. He's not here. There is the place they laid him, and it's empty. He has slipped out of death's clutches. But don't worry. Just go and tell the disciples and tell Peter, who's still beating himself up because of his betrayal, tell the disciples and especially tell Peter that the risen Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee, to the place where it all began, and there you will see him just as he promised, and all will begin again. The sad things will become untrue. And all will turn towards life. One last unexpected time in the early morning, Jesus has given his followers the slip yet again. And yet again, Mark's gospel ends as it's been throughout. People trying, panting to keep up with Jesus and where he's going to go next. The sun climbs over the hills, the mist fades, the air warms, the birds chirp cheerfully. The future is as open as that tomb. And it is the first morning of forever. And then, this is what we read. This is how Mark ends the gospel. So they went and fled from the tomb, fled for terror and amazement. The Greek words for terror and amazement, actually the ones that give us the English words trauma and ecstasy. So they went out and fled the tomb for trauma and ecstasy. Terror and amazement had seized them and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. And that's it. That's where Mark ends his story of the good news about Jesus. The frightened women running away from the tomb, so ecstatic and yet traumatized that they're afraid to tell anybody what they've seen, at least at first. Now, I know your Bible might have a few more verses in it, but those verses are not in the earliest biblical manuscripts of Mark's gospel. Nearly all real Bible scholars agree that those other verses were added later by folks who thought the ending was too abrupt, that it needed to include some of the other information that are offered by Matthew and Luke and John. Because it's so strange, this sudden ending, it's jarring. In fact, when you read the original Greek language, the Gospel of Mark basically ends in the middle of a sentence. Here's how it goes if you read it word for word. Afraid they were for... Now, why does Mark end that way? It's a mystery. There's some Bible scholars who think that what happened is the original ending of the Gospel was lost that it would have been the outer part of the manuscript, and they wonder if it just got cut off like a book that has the last page torn out. That often happened in the ancient world with those kind of manuscripts. 
Some people have even suggested that maybe Mark died or was dragged away before he could finish the rest of the gospel. But I think there's one other explanation, one explanation that is really important to understanding what the gospel means for us and what Easter means for us today. Some years ago, there was a popular television show about a mobster. And the time came for the show to have its series finale and everyone was anticipating. They couldn't wait to see how it would end. Would the mobster live? Would he get whacked? In the final scene, the mobster and his family are in a diner in New Jersey and the jukebox is playing that rock song by Journey. We quoted it in an earlier sermon. Don't stop believing. And the camera scans around the diner and it focuses in on these suspicious characters there in the restaurant and the suspense builds and it feels like something dramatic is about to happen and the music rises to a crescendo and suddenly the screen goes black. Fade to black. What just happened? I'm told many people watching it called their cable company (laughs) because they thought their TV had gone out yet again. And they were probably on hold for eight days talking (laughs) to someone there. Um, But no, that's precisely how the writer decided to end the series. A mysterious fade to black that raises more questions than it gives answers. The creator didn't want to tie up all the loose ends. He wanted to leave you uncomfortable. He wanted to let you determine the ending. And some people loved it, but probably maybe more people hated it because there's something in human nature that just wants a resolution. But everybody talked about it. The creator knew what he was doing, ending the series that way. And I think Mark knows exactly what he's doing too. Once, one of the Bible scholar Donald Jewell's seminary students decided to memorize the entire gospel of Mark and then perform it Broadway style in front of a live audience. And the student decided to end his performance exactly the way Mark does, kind of abruptly. Now, the first time the student did this, though, after he spoke the last ambiguous verse, so they went out and fled the tomb and said nothing to anyone, afraid they were for... He just stopped and stood there awkwardly, just kind of shifting from foot to foot. And in the silence, the audience was sitting there waiting for more, waiting for closure, waiting for a proper ending. And finally, after several silent, anxious seconds, the student decided to just say, Amen, and made his exit. And the relieved audience went, whew, and applauded loudly and appreciatively. But when he thought about it later, the the student realized that that providing the audience with a satisfying conclusion by saying amen and giving them closure that they wanted had let them off the hook. He decided Mark wanted to leave people dangling, wanting more, unresolved. And so at the next performance, when he reached the final verse, he simply paused for a half beat and just left the stage in silence. The Bible scholar Donald Jewell, who was there, said the discomfort and uncertainty within the audience were obvious. And as the people exited, the buzz of conversation was dominated by the experience of a non-ending. Mark wants to give us an experience of a non-ending. The start of Mark's gospel is just a fragment of a sentence that says, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. And then, just as he started, Mark ends his gospel mid-sentence, a non-ending, a fade to black that leaves you longing to know what happens next. But you see, we determine what happens next. This scripture is a choose-your-own-adventure. Mark wants to let us know that the resurrection, Jesus' story, didn't end with just this happy story. If he ended the story here, Jesus might even have stayed entombed in the pages of a book. The big stone of the ending rolled in front. But Mark gives us the experience of a non-ending because the story hasn't ended. Jesus is alive. The whole gospel is just the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. Chapter 1, 
of the never-ending story. And that story lives and breathes and continues with us alive now. Now, maybe you came here today like the women to the tomb, hoping to pay your respects to that kind but dead teacher named Jesus and then go home and hunt Easter eggs and go back to life as usual. But I have some ecstatic trauma, some goosebump raising news for you, news of a you catastrophe. I get to be the man in the white robe, not a young man, but a man in a white robe. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He's not here. He's not here. He's not here. You just missed him. But don't stop believing. (laughs) What I mean is he has been raised. He is alive and on the loose. He has gone ahead of you. He is going before you into Galilee. He is going before you into Greensboro, into Summerfield and High Point. He is going before you to Oak Ridge and Brown Summit and Charlotte and Kenya. He is going before you into Monday morning, into your home, into your place of work. You will meet him there and everywhere and in between, including the places you least expect him to be because Jesus is not dead. He is alive. And if you look for him, you will meet him there just as he promised. The question is, will we respond to this news like Mary's, the two Marys and Salome did at first? Will we encounter something so beyond our limited imagination, so life-changing and world-changing, that we'll just be overwhelmed or made afraid by it and just keep it to ourselves and keep everything the same? Or will we go, will we leave changed, and we will, will we share the good news? That Jesus is real. That Christ is alive. Today is the first morning of forever. Today our life with God starts over and begins again. And that story will not end. But let me tell you one last thing. One last thing if you hear nothing else hear this. Following Jesus, trying and stumbling, however failingly to keep up with him, will be the greatest adventure you have ever known. Because when you experience his love, when you come to know his healing, when you share his life, when you join others in his beautiful mission, what you will discover is Of this song go, oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing his praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, our God. Andres and I are going to sing this chorus for us one time before we begin this song so that when we get to the chorus in a minute, we really can raise our voices together. Would you stand?
cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. And I see his words, his hands, his feet, my Savior. As we conclude this service of resurrection, it's not really concluded. Our life is just beginning, as we've said. Um, I hope that this time of worship has been so joyful as it has been for me and that this is what you'll carry in your hearts and lives. Just a few uh, 
invitations if you want to go out that way either any of the doors actually and go to the front lawn we have a cross that we're filling with flowers and we'd love for you to be part of that uh, we also have photographs we'll have people out there that will take your family's photo or photos of you si quieren ahora ir a la parte de enfrente de la iglesia para que les saquemos sus fotos cerca de la cruz que está adornado con flores nos encantaría verlas allá um, so please just feel free to come out that way. Uh, we also would love to get a group photo, and we have a photographer ready to take a group photo. If that's possible, we'd love for you to stay. That would be great. This week, uh, tomorrow, we have our office closed because of the Easter holiday. We get some time off. On Wednesday, we will have our Wednesday night out time together, eating together, and all of you are invited, 545. Thank you for worshiping with us on this Resurrection Sunday. Just a, a few last things. If you're new to us at all, we have some gift bags out on the front lawn in a wagon. They're really for you. They're a gift from our congregation. Feel free to grab one as you're leaving today. We'd love for you to take that. And as we do go out, there are like four doors here in the sanctuary. You're welcome to use those doors because it's a big crowd today and it, we might get kind of clogged up back there. So feel free to use that as well. And remember, our, our kids are going to be releasing the butterflies on the front lawn too. So we hope you'll come out and join us and stay a minute and appreciate that. But we're so glad to see celebrate Easter with you um, as we go forth from this place. I'm not going to give a final blessing because it's not finished. Our worship isn't finished. Our service isn't finished. But, but let's go forward from this place because Jesus isn't here. He's gone ahead of us mm. and he will meet us just as he promised. Praise God. So let's go in life and in hope and in joy. Amen. Amen. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. 